Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Today we're going to spend about an hour going over the basics of doing National History Day. My name is Wendy Rex Atset, and I'm the state coordinator for the National History Day program in Utah. So we are, um, we do have a group of teachers joining us on this during this session and you may hear from them today. We've already done our introductions. I do wanna let everyone know that there are three people in the um, state office for National History Day, myself, um, and then my assistants, Heidi and Tatiana, and you may get emails or information from any of the three of us. So just so that you know who's who in the state office, there are three people. Um, and Heidi and Tatiana are both part-time, but they are also both NHD. Um, Tatiana is a former NHD student and Heidi is a NHD parent and a regional contest coordinator. Um, and both of them have strong background in history. So I have a note here that you'll appear in the gallery, but you won't because of the way the recording works. Please keep your audio muted, um, but ask your questions as they come up so that we can address them in the flow of the information. I wanna let everybody know that um, classroom kits will be mailed out to everyone who has asked for one as soon as we get the books from NHD, and we're still waiting for those to arrive here um, on August 1st. And then you will get a certificate for relicensure points according to the sessions that you complete in real time with us. Okay, today we'll talk about some of the basics about doing National History Day. We'll talk about why, why you use this program, why is it effective? We'll talk about the five creative categories that can, can choose from. We will go over in, in a, a bird's eye view of the NHD research process. And then we'll talk about the NHD contests that are offered here in the state get a little bit into planning your timeline and then spend some time um, just making sure you are, are familiar with NHD's official contest rules and our judging criteria that we use. So why, why does NHD work for kids? Um, I am going to go over this kind of quickly, but if, if you are familiar with the show um, Dinosaur Train, you, you may remember that at the end, Dr. Scott, the paleontologist comes on at the end of every episode and he says, you know, you've learned something about dinosaurs today, but now it's time for you to get outside and make your own discoveries. And I think that that is exactly what National History Day offers to students because we're not delivering historical information to students. We're empowering them to do their own research work with the primary sources themselves and make their own discoveries about history and how it connects to them in their lives. And it's very powerful giving them that um, individualized opportunity for learning and something they can really invest in. It's also a terrific program for differentiation. We have students at literally such a wide range of learning levels, not just that we support fourth grade through 12th grade, so a huge range of ages, but, um, but also students who are English language learners. We have a lot of teachers who love this program because it gives them a vehicle to do a lot of that literacy learning. Um, and no matter what group of students you're working with, wherever they start with this process, they will build skills and they will grow. And so it's a terrific program to allow you to differentiate with the students that you're working with. We really center student voice and student choice through the NHD model. And we give students an opportunity to flex their creative muscles through the different creative categories that we offer. So all of these things combine to make this a really powerful learning experience for students that they can really get invested in. Um, when you're thinking about meeting the standards that you need to meet in the classroom, we offer, this is a great model that allows you to check a lot of boxes from 21st century skills, the Utah Social Studies core, which really is, you know, brings a lot of literacy skills and historical thinking skills into the core, analyzing primary sources, looking at multiple perspectives, it is a great way 
to um, address civic education because students will build civic skills and foundations through this program, both developing historical literacy as well as, um, and this is so crucial, media literacy um, and what Stanford History Education Group is calling civic online reasoning. Those skills are really built into what they would be doing with NHD. Um, in terms of standardized testing, NHD uh, did a national study a few years ago called NHD Works that demonstrated that the skills that students develop through NHD bring test scores up. So if that's something that you need to reference, it's available on our website. And then Common Core, um, students who do NHD are going to meet at least 25 Common Core objectives in English language arts. So it's a powerhouse. There are a lot of elements to doing a project. And so it really does help you um, meet your own goals and the, the, the standards that you need to be meeting in your classroom. So I mentioned the importance of media, online media literacy. And thinking, I mean, we all know this, but the, the, um, the internet is full of horrible information, right? And yet students go to the internet to get their information. And so learning about sourcing and looking for credible places on the internet to find resources, both primary and secondary sources for doing history, these are real skill building activities that are going to translate across to kids' use of social media and their ability to um, be consumers in the media environment. And that, that builds directly into um, kind of a civic skills and foundations angle as well. The thing that I love most about NHD is that it, it makes history relevant to actual students. And so I have so many examples of this over the years. You'll see the two pictures of um, the girl here. Her name is Madeline and she's from Orem. And she, she absolutely loves History Day and has done excellent work over multiple years being involved in the program through middle school and into high school. And um, right before the pandemic, she decided to do her project on the ghost army because her great grandfather was part of that unit during World War II. And it's a unit that had been kept classified into the 90s. And so they had never had any recognition. And he actually had kept what he, was, what he did during the war a secret from his family until his wife had passed away. And it, it became something he could talk about much later in his life. So she wanted to work on that and she ended up doing a lot of her own oral history with him and with his friends that are were surviving veterans of that unit. She took, she created an, a stellar project and it went to the national contest that year. While we have the kids in Washington, DC, um, we always take them to meet our delegation. And so she was ready to lobby our congressman about supporting some legislation that was going to give recognition and benefits to veterans of the ghost army. So she really bridged like a heritage topic with um, original research and civic engagement all through her experience with this ghost army project. And you can see she's wearing a medal at nationals. Her project won the national prize for best project on World War II history that's given by the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. It's a super competitive prize to win. So, so that's one end of the spectrum. Somebody who really, by the time she did this project, she was several years into doing an HD. So she had built a lot of skills and she was executing at a really high level. By this time, that doesn't happen for every student, but every student builds from where they are. And so we have um, so many examples of kids who their teachers will say, the most unexpected students in my class grab onto this project because it really empowers them. So this little boy on the lower left, he's from Ephraim and he did his project on the Mexican revolution and talked about its impact on his own family. 
we see that so many times where students who are either just don't feel like history or social studies means that much to them, they cannot make a connection to how it matters to their lives today or their understanding of the moment that they live in. And this project helps them connect those dots in really powerful ways. So really, it, it runs the range of supporting students. And as I was mentioning before we started the recording, just keep in mind that this model is super flexible. It is a great way to get students doing integrated learning. If you can build a team that kind of joins um, English, social studies, and ideally your librarian media specialist, you can really support students um, in each of those classes or in each of those um, disciplines. And, um, and then you, you also kind of have the support of a team rather than trying to direct all of this research on your own. So again, take what works from the model. The limit on this is if you're gonna be sending kids into the, into the tournaments in the spring, you wanna make sure that they are prepared for, for those experiences and that you are using the, the rubric, our criteria, and that their projects are going to match up kind of what the other projects look like in the competitions. But the competitions are um, optional. Um, so if it doesn't work for you in your first year to do the competitions, that's totally fine. So we get a lot of questions. Um, we used to call this program Utah History Day, and we found that people thought they could only do projects on Utah history, but that's not the case. You can use NHD in pretty much any year that you're teaching or um, content area that you're teaching in social studies. It doesn't, the topics do not, are not limited to Utah history. It can be world history, US history, Utah history, or any kind of subcategory. Um, the ages that our program supports statewide start in fourth grade, and we have some areas where we have a lot of elementary school age students doing this, and then we have other areas where all of the kids are in middle school. I would say that high school is about our smallest age group, and I know that this is because high school kids just get so busy, it's harder to fit a project like this in. That doesn't mean that without the support of a high school teacher, they they can't do it. It just means that we have a lot of high school teachers who are teaching AP and feel like this is um, enough extra that it's difficult for them to work it into the courses that they're doing. I would love to see that change in Utah. Um, what does it cost? It's At this time, it's free to participate in competitions that are held in Utah. There are fees to participate at the national contest. I do fundraising. Um, to offset those fees. So right now we have sponsors who pay them. Um, but our national contest is scheduled to go back to in-person next year. And, it, and if that all happens and COVID doesn't rear its head again, um, students who go that far are gonna be going to Washington DC for a week. And we do not have the funds to pay for everyone's trip. And so that is a cost to know about. The other costs to know about are just the costs involved with creating a project. And that varies a lot depending on the category that the students choose to do. Um, and then does this have to be done as a class assignment? It doesn't. Uh, we have some schools where teachers do it with a small group or a club after school. We have um, a number of older students who continue to do it on their own and that's totally fine. They can compete as an independent student. Um, so they don't have to be affiliated with a classroom teacher to enter our tournaments. It will work better for kids if it is integrated into a class in some way because they will, um, it's not opt-outable, right? It will give them a little bit of that required element that they don't kind of drift away from the project because it is, that takes time to go through the whole process of bringing a project from start to finish. And so it is helpful for students if it's integrated into classwork in some way, but there are a lot of different ways you can do that. Any questions right now about the FAQs or other, other questions so far? 
Okay, I'm going to move on. We'll talk now about the five creative categories. And just note and bookmark that at the NHD Utah main website, we have created a project gallery there that allows you and your students and your parents to look at real NHD projects for examples of like how they look, what students do with the, with the kind of medium it is. It's a great place for the kids to look for the kind of category they might wanna choose and also for mo models of what a project could look like. So make sure that you're aware of that gallery. So um, we offer five creative categories. They all ask students to basically take the same research and analysis and judging criteria, but then present in a creative way in one of these forms. So documentary filmmaking, um, we have students who absolutely love doing the filmmaking and they've done it before. We also have students who just wanna learn how to make a, make a film. And so those are the kids who really gravitate towards the documentary category. I wanna point out that last fall, Utah Film Center offered us some really specialized training for, um, geared towards National History Day documentaries. And those training sessions and materials are available for you to use on our Padlet. Um, we aren't gonna offer them again this year because the trainings that we got were just terrific and you can access those on your own. So the, this category is really good for topics where there are a lot of historic images, video clips, audio clips, that kind of thing available for students to use because they need to fill up to 10 minutes of video time to accompany their script. And so if you have students who wanna do a documentary but their, their topic doesn't lend themselves because it just there aren't that many visuals to go with it, that's something to keep in mind. A different category might be better for them. Okay, the exhibit category. This is, um, this is probably the one that you think of first um, because it's the most like a science fair where students are creating a 3D tabletop display. And um, this is actually a picture of our assistant Tatiana back when she was an NHD student. And um, she always competed in exhibit category and she went to nationals several times. The exhibit behind her shows you kind of the maximum size of an NHD exhibit. But if you're working with younger students or novices, um, you don't have to make the project that large. So it's scalable. Um, students who really enjoy visual arts, mixed media, anything 3D, a lot of kids will put together a diorama or some kind of a 3D display to go on the tabletop part of their exhibit. So it's good for kids who like that. Um, there is a very stringent word count limit in this category and that makes it very challenging for kids because they have to get their narrative down to the essentials and that, that can be a difficult. On the other hand, for younger kids and for novices, that, that word limit isn't, it becomes sort of helpful. So again, thinking about the pros and the cons for the students that you are working with. This is a great category if students have historic images, um, not just photos, but also maps or other kinds of documents that they can include on the project as well as artifacts. Our third creative category is the performance category. You know the students you have in your class who love theater, you know, who love music, who like to do set design. This, this category is amazing for them. They will create um, a 10 minute live performance that they perform at the contest for the judges. And so it isn't, um, they, we are, when we are not doing virtual competitions, it is a category that's done live. I guess that's the best way to say it. So again, if they can get their hands on artifacts or images, it's funding incorporate or recreate those in performances but the students are responsible not just for the research and the analysis, but they also have to write the script, figure out how they're gonna stage this 10 minute play, um, design, develop characters that are either um, historical people or representative of historical people and events. And so 
um, it's the whole package and they need to do that all by themselves. And we offer the website category which is a terrific category for kids who are interested in web design, media, tech, that kind of thing. It's great for topics that have historic images, historic documents, audio, video, because they can integrate audio and video clips into the website really seamlessly. They are required to use NHD's proprietary web builder. The reason for that is because of um, FERPA and other online student privacy laws, where we needed to create a platform that kids could build their websites on that is not searchable by the public. So it's secure. It's also the website builder is, is somewhat advanced and it can be difficult for younger kids to learn how to use it. It's not intuitive like Google Sites or um, Weebly. It's more like WordPress. So just, just so you know, um, there can be some learning involved in creating a website for NHD. And then we offer the paper category. And you might think that this is our smallest category, but it isn't. There are a lot of students who really enjoy writing. One advantage to the paper category is it's very easy to edit and revise as they go, um, where some of the other projects are much harder to do that. It's great if they have good historic documents with things they can quote um, and, and, and images as well. Although images aren't integrated into the body of the paper, they go in appendices. Um, but really for students who love to write, this is a great category. So those are the five categories. And then at our competitions, we break that down. So we don't just have five categories at the competitions. Students compete in the age division for their age group. So we offer three age divisions. Um, youth division is the one that we, we call for fourth and fifth graders. The junior division is sixth, seventh, eighth, and then the senior division is ninth through 12th grade. And as I mentioned, our junior division is always the biggest one. We further break down the five creative categories because we allow students to work as an individual or as part of a small group. And so all five of the creative categories allow students to enter as an individual. And those um, projects are only judged against other individual projects in their age division. And then our group categories do not include the paper. So you can have a small group of up to five students that work together from the very start of the process on a documentary, an exhibit, a performance, or a website, but groups may not work on papers. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, what that means, because we have the nine different competition categories and we offer them in all three age divisions that at our bigger contests, like the Salt Lake Regional and at State, we end up with 27 distinct categories where the students in each category are competing against the other students just in that competition category. So we have three age divisions, five creative categories, but nine competition categories. Questions about that? Okay, I will move on and we'll talk now about the NHD process. So I'm not going to take the time to show this video today. Um, it's a great three minute video featuring students from 2015 um, at our state contest. It's, it was at Thanksgiving point that year, um, also 2016. So that, um, but it is a wonderful way for you to introduce this program to your students and to parents. Um, I think it's a terrific idea to do some kind of an introduction to parent for parents as they begin the process that can cut down a little bit on um, that unexpected nature of like, oh, wow, we're doing a lot of this at home or whatever it is. So this is front and center right at the top of our website. And you can share this video in your classes. You can share it with your team and your admin and your parents, get them excited about doing an HD. Well, it's gonna play. I'm gonna move on just to save time. 
Okay, so you're going to start by introducing the program and creating some expectations and just vis visuals of what this is even going to look like. The next step is to talk about our annual theme and we have a different annual theme every single year. There are usually a rotation of about seven or eight different themes that kind of tend to come back up. So this year's theme is frontiers in history, people's place, people, places, and ideas. And I'm not going to go into depth on this today either, but I am doing a focus theme session um, this week. I think it's on Thursday and then another one later in the month. And then all of the resources that we have for teaching and using the theme are going to be available at our teacher Padlet. There will be the webinars that I do, the slide deck that I have created. Um, we're working on some handouts that accompany kind of the more in-depth materials that NHD has put together, that curriculum book that we're waiting for that we'll send out with their classroom kits. NHD has created a graphic organizer. They've done some webinars as well. So there will be lots of resources on this theme of frontiers. Um, and you can access, you can talk to all of them from the NHD Utah Teacher Padlet. All right, so as you're talking about the theme, kids are going to be thinking about the topic that they want to work on. And just as they, as you enter that topic selection period of time, keep in the front of your mind that choosing a topic takes time and research on the part of students, especially with younger students who have come in with a very, very small um, bank of historical knowledge, right? Um, so the idea here with that topic selection process, and I will talk about this in a lot more depth um, in the theme session, is that we don't want to limit topic choice at the get-go. We want kids to find a topic that's gonna be interesting to them, that they're gonna enjoy learning about and researching. And so we don't assign everybody to do Utah history. We don't assign everybody to do, we're all doing the War of 1812. We really want to give students the space to find a topic that's going to be interesting and relevant to them. And almost anything can be a history day topic as long as they can link it back to that annual theme and as long as it's historical. Um, so we do want to steer kids away from current events. Um, questions about that? Okay. After they've chosen the topic they're going to work on, then you move into the research and analysis phase of the process. And so students are going to need to use secondary sources as well as primary sources in their research. And there really is an order of operations here. They need to start by spending a good amount of time in secondary sources on their topics so that they develop an understanding of the historiography, the history that we know about this thing, as well as the historical context of the time. And then, then they can start working with primary sources. Primary sources are the historical evidence that they will use to help make their argument. And so the research process, um, you can think of it as a two-step thing, but I kind of think it a, Think of it as a more circular process where they're going to start with secondary sources then they will move into primary sources. They will do analysis of the sources as they go. And ideally, they're going to get bit by their topic and they're going to continue to want to research more and dig a little deeper. And that's where it becomes circular because they can continue to add more secondary sources and add more primary sources and change their thesis as they go because this process is inquiry and it will build its own momentum. And so it, I, I, I love to see kids start with some research targets like I need five secondary sources on Monday and I need 10 primary sources two weeks after that. But I also love them to have the, um, the expectation that those are minimums, right? Whatever works for the kids that you're working with. And so that they can kind of um, experience that exploration and discovery rather than just checking boxes. 
So after they've worked with, they've done that research, they've worked with their sources, they've done source analysis, they're starting to put together their own, in their own mind, their own understanding of their topic. That's when you move into the outlining thesis writing and, and basically content writing phase of the work. This is a great little model from the Minnesota program. Um, they, they, think they always use this idea of a Tootsie Roll for how to map out your documentary script. I think it works equally well for a performance project and, and all, almost for any project where um, they can fill in the content, the background, the context, what their thesis statement is, where that's gonna fit in their the presentation, what their main event is, and then the impacts, short and long-term impacts, and their conclusions. Okay. And then finally, they take all of that written work and they build a final project in one of those five creative categories. Again, depending on the students that you're working with, this can be something that happens relatively quickly, like in a small exhibit board, like we see in the middle, or if it's performance or documentary, those projects take a lot of time to develop just to build the entry and develop that entry, do all of the costuming, do all of the documentary editing and all of that sort of thing. So have in your mind that this isn't something that happens in just a couple of days. And finally, students are, um, need to create our required written materials. It's a mouthful, but basically what it means is this is how they are documenting their research. We ask them to write a process paper it's short, we have question prompts that they answer, it's a maximum of 500 words. And then they also need to create an annotated bibliography that documents the sources that they used. They can use, you can use MLA style or Chicago, whatever works for your school. Most of our kids end up using MLA because that's what they're doing in their English classes and that's fine. And so those are usually the last things that they write right before their project finished project is due. Okay, before we move into contests, are there questions about the NHD process? Okay, I'm gonna move into our contest cycle. So this is a tournament-based program. Those competitions are very effective for motivating students to, um, work a little harder on their project and, and to keep working on it. So students will begin in some way at the school or district level. And this varies a lot depending on where you are and the school where you teach. So we have, and most of the school and district um, events happen in February or perhaps even earlier in the year. We currently have district level competitions at Canyons and Ogden School District. Um, and we're hoping that Beaver is able to come back online now that we're moving out of our virtual um, COVID model. We're hoping also that Jordan District is going to start soon having its own district level competition. And so depending on what school you teach in, like if you teach in within Canyons District boundaries, but you teach at a charter school, you don't go to their district contest that serves the district schools. Um, same with Ogden. If you, if you don't live in the boundaries of any of these school districts, or if you teach for a charter or a private school, or you're in homeschool setting, your students will go directly into the regional contest for your area. Um, if you don't have a district level competition, that serves your school, I strongly encourage you to do a showcase event at your school to honor the work of the, all of the students in your classes who participated in NHD. And then at most of these, you will be selecting the kids that go up to the regional from your school. So most of our regional competitions happen in March. Right now we have these seven and you go to the contest that serves the area where your students live. Um, each of these competitions is run by a different coordinator or team of coordinators, and they each have their own website 
where you will register your student and upload paperwork or project links and where students will receive their evaluation forms at the end of that competition. And so you need to make sure that when you get to registration time, which is January, February, that you are going to the correct contest to start that registration process for your kids. And you can link out to all of these from the main NHD Utah website. Um, the state contest is the one that I coordinate and that's always in April. Next year, our contest is April 27th and 28th. We hold it at the Utah Cultural Celebration Center, which is in West Valley City. It's a beautiful venue. And what we've done, um, we did this last year, is we split the contest over two days and we have each age division kind of in the venue at its own time. That really helped spread out the crowds and allow us to utilize the space a little better and um, just make it more comfortable for people. We kind of overran that space when we tried to run everything on the same day. And so COVID, COVID made us rethink how we use that venue. So um, I believe we're doing junior division on the 27th and then senior and youth divisions on the 28th, I believe, or it could be the other way around. But junior is one day by itself and then senior and youth I can layer those into the venue so that they aren't on top of each other. And then from the state contest, we send the top two projects in each of the nine categories in the junior and senior divisions on to nationals. And the national contest always happens the week before Father's Day. And everything we're hearing right now um, tells us that we'll be going back to Washington DC next summer, which is really exciting. So we end up sending about 60 to 65 students to nationals every year because with the individual and the group projects, that's usually where our numbers are. Um, but at the very beginning of the process, when um, students are working on this in their classrooms, we have several thousand students doing an HD in their schools. And as, they, as the top projects advance up from school, district, regional to state and on to nationals, we end up with just that small core of about 60 students who compete at the highest level. Are there questions I can answer about this? Okay, I'll move on. So how to do your backwards planning after looking at that tournament progression. So what you need to do is first know which local contest is going to serve you. If you are in a Canyons District Public School or an Ogden District Public School, your first local contest will be that district contest. So you need to find out what date that is, and then you need to look at when the registration and project submissions are due for that contest. And usually those are due about four weeks before the actual contest date, because um, there's quite a bit of uh, work on the back end to put a competition together. And so if, for example, your district contest at Ogden District, and don't quote me because I can't remember exactly when that's happening, let's say it's February 20th, probably your registrations will be due jan about January 20th. And so that's the date that you start with for your backwards planning. And then you need to decide how many weeks you're going to devote to NHD with your students and kind of the, the pace or the intensity that you want um, for that project. And that will help you know when to start and when to have when to set your completion deadlines. So I have some, there are there are many different ways to break this down. <laughs> many, many different ways. This is just um, one way to think about it. We have some teachers who will do this particularly in an elementary school setting in a more intensive way where they really dig into it for six weeks and give the kids a lot of time in class to work on their projects, but they keep it to six weeks or so. I wouldn't try to do it in less. Um, and this is kind of how you might block that time out in that six week intensive model. Um, but especially with older kids or kids who have done this kind of work before and can go into a lot greater depth, I would really recommend giving them more time um, to, 
do that topic selection, to do that research and source analysis, and to develop those final projects. So these are just samples of how you might think about blocking that time. I have a number of teachers who like to do this in the fall, and they start right at the beginning of the school year, and they work, you know, whatever time block, however they framed it out into their year. They have the projects wrapped up before you go on that winter break. The reason, one of the reasons they do this is because it allows them to avoid overlapping with other big projects that the kids might have on their schedules at other time of the year. If your school is doing science fair or, um, you know, any, any of the other big projects that, that kids are working on intensively, it's good not to overlap. And so I've got a lot of teachers who get their projects all done. They have may, might have their school showcase in December. And then when it, our tournament season starts, they already know who's going on. And the kids then have time to kind of go back and do a little more work, polish up their projects in time for the spring competitions. But this is where you have a ton of flexibility to fit this into the year here in a way that works for you. And I do have more detailed sample um, timelines where you know it breaks down certain assignments and activities by week that you can borrow from and create what's going to work for you. Okay, before we move on, are there questions about backwards planning? Okay. I want to make sure that you know that this is what the rule book looks like that you should be using. We did a massive re revision of this a couple of years ago. And so um, use the one that has this cover, do not use anything that's older. And one of the things I love about the newer rule book is that we built a lot of guidebook and um, processes and definitions into this so that it's more of a resource and less of a checklist. And so it's something that you can use early in the process as you use those guidebook elements and then come back to it later when students are building their projects because this is also the place where you find the nitty gritty specifics on like how big an exhibit board can be, what's the maximum size, um, you know, how many words are allowed in a website project, all of those very specific details are available for you in the rule book and coming back for those as students begin to build their project makes a lot of sense. But you really can use the rule book throughout the process, both to guide and answer questions and help students with concepts and definitions, as well as to shape that project so that it meets um, our judging criteria and our, uh, judge, our project parameters so that kids aren't building something that's way too big or too long. Okay, so that's what the rule book looks like. It's available for free on the web. You can get it through our Padlet and we'll also be putting a copy into your classroom kits. Some of the rules to have in mind right at the beginning, right as students are thinking about what they wanna work on, they need to choose a new and different, different topic each contest year. So if you are working with students who have done History Day before they get to your class, make sure they are doing something that is new and different. It is not fair to the 90% of kids um, who are choosing a brand new topic that are doing research from absolute square one to have students come in and reuse research that they did the year before. It's just not fair. And so everybody needs a new topic and preferably a substantially new topic so that people are doing, um, everybody's starting kind of from square one on their research. It's really important that the projects are the original work of the students, that they are not pooling or sharing research among a larger group. It, it's smart for you to put some limits on like, we can only have one project on each topic in my classroom, right? We don't want three projects on the Underground Railroad coming out of one classroom. So that students are doing the work on their own, they have to do the thinking 
Um, it's great to start at the beginning by talking about plagiarism early and then through the process, because this is one program that is so good for teaching about plagiarism, what it is and how citations and footnotes and um, bibliographies and all of these practices that we use um, to document our work and our sourcing, that is what you do to avoid committing plagiarism. And that those are skills that are developmental and very specific to the age group that you're working with, the way that you would teach those. But this is a great vehicle to build that into what you're doing. And I would, again, start with those conversations early. It's important to set expectations about how much adult help and what kind of adult help is reasonable for your students. Um, and this depends a lot on the age groups that you're working with and also honestly kind of the demographics that you're working with. You know your parents, you know if you have a lot of helicopter parents and that's going to frame how you talk about this. You're also going to know if you have a lot of students whose parents are working three jobs and are just not going to be involved in this project. Um, and the way um, that you need to frame this up for them. In general, the, the way the rules are written about reasonable adult help is, is somewhat nonspecific because our program covers or is open to such a wide range of students that that looks different in every setting. But you can be very clear about, um, you know, your parents can drive you to the library. Your parents can take you to the store to buy your materials. Um, we definitely want parents using power tools if things need to be drilled or sawed. Um, you know, those are good things for parents to do. We really don't want parents to be doing the intellectual labor. And then also at the beginning to remember that hazardous materials are strictly prohibited in our contest venues. And this includes weapons. And you would be surprised how many students want to incorporate some kind of weapon either into an exhibit or a performance. Um, we have clarified these rules so that even replicas are really not allowed in our competitions. And I actually have had parents walk into a competition with a rifle and tell me it's fine to put this out by the exhibit because they took out the pin. It's not fine. It is never fine. No guns, no swords, no axes, no hatchets, um, anything that's hazardous. Um, they're just not allowed, okay? So those are things that it's helpful to know at the beginning. And then I just wanna quickly run down the judging criteria that we use at the competitions. This is how the students projects are going to be evaluated. And I think it's good to have in your mind sort of where you're going, where the students are going with the judging criteria. And so at the top of our judging rubric, and um, you will see historical argument, thesis, claim, and theme connection. And these are a little bit bundled together. <laughs> We, however, they are not the things that your students will do first, right? They are gonna start with theme connections and their topic, but they're not really gonna be able to write their thesis and know what their argument is until they've already done quite a bit of research and thinking about their project. Um, wide research, hang on just one quick second. I need to respond to an urgent message here. Okay. Wide research, again, this is kind of a flexible criteria, but we are looking for students to, in an agent developmentally appropriate way, be using a variety of sources that are credible, both secondary sources and primary sources. This is where you have an opportunity to um, talk about how Wikipedia and Google don't know everything um, and to, to direct students to online archives and online museums and institutions that offer credible information for their research 
and also to make sure that they're not just replying, relying on like one newspaper article and that's their whole project. Again, we want students to be using different sources in their project. I realize that this is gonna look very different in fifth grade than it looks in you know, 10th grade. And so that's, that's kind of why the criteria is written in a generic way. Um, we have a criteria for the primary sources that are used in the project and the way the students are using them, uh, the way they are analyzing them. We're using this as a scaffold for kids to move from just using pictures to decorate their board to using at, um, primary sources as the evidence that they are making their analysis on. We ask students to include the historical context of their topic in the project and also to include more than one perspective in their project to explore different sides of the story rather than just narrating one um, perspective or one making it an opinion paper. This isn't an opinion project. It is a evidence-based argument kind of project. We have a criteria um, for historical accuracy relying on credible sources information rather of information rather than opinion um, and, and hopefully helping us to direct students away from um, Wikipedia and other sorts of unvetted types of resource, sources of information. We ask students, the significance in history is really about outcomes and impacts. And we ask students to talk about that in their project and then we have a relatively new criterion called student voice. What we've found over time as students do more and more internet research is that they, it's so easy to just cut and paste a lot of quotes from primary sources and from experts that their own analysis is lost in the project. And so student voice is really a way for us to say, we want to know what you think and we want you to write your project using your own words and share with us your ideas, your analysis, and your argument in the project, rather than just saying, here's all the research that I did. You can see it in my quotes, right? We don't want that student voice to be lost. And then for each of the creative categories, there are certain criteria um, for the visuals, the writing, the audio, the technical, and the clarity of that presentation. And those are specific to each category. So those, those are the criteria that the judges will use to evaluate the projects and, and the students will get back a rubric um, that includes both kind of marks in each of the criteria, as well as um, written comments from the judges. And all of that written feedback from the judges, we're very clear with them that no matter how, how strong the project is, every single student needs to receive feedback on what they've done well and feedback on where they could improve the project. And so even the very best projects in this, in the group or in the contest are going to get suggestions for improvement across the board, as well as kudos on what they've done well. Okay, um, I'm going to turn off the slides here in a second so we can chat, but before I do that, make sure that you bookmark the NHD Utah and the NHD.org websites for the tools and materials that are available there. I would say those are um, just two. There are some other affiliate programs that have wonderful materials available that you can look through and pull what you would like. Minnesota has a good one. Um, Ohio has some great, not just those two, there are many. Um, California's got great stuff. Idaho's developed some wonderful things. So, you know, depending on your time, I would start with our website and the national ones, um, but you can also look at other state NHD programs or resources. Also, you want to identify your local contest and bookmark that website so that you can check for your contest dates and registration deadlines easily. And then, um, just know that on the NHD Utah website, we've developed student toolkits and teacher toolkits using Padlets that really offer you a way to get into those, use those resources in a really fluid way with your students. 
So I'm going to turn off the screen, share. We can do questions, and then I'll do a quick tour of the websites if you want to stick around. Can I answer any questions before we do that? No. Jeanette, yeah. So on your breakdown of um, how you block out the time on those weeks, how much time would you say they would be spending or does it just really vary? We have an AB schedule. And so I get the kids, you know, between either two or three days a week for, you know, 75 minutes for a class period. So, but then I also, I'm an ELA teacher. So I've got to, <laughs> I've got to kind of balance it with what they're learning in ELA. Um, is there anywhere that there's kind of a broken down timeline of how much, how many in-class hours you kind of spend on, that you give them on research versus how much at home or any recommendations? I don't have a timeline that's broken down by hours, but I do have um, one that's broken down by weeks and by um, kind of like target deadlines for this is the this is the this is the assignment that is due this week. Right. Um, and I know that the teacher that helped me develop that she devotes one class day a week mm -hmm. with middle schoolers. Okay. And, but but again. It varies so broadly, widely, depending on who you're working with and the skills that they're bringing in. Um, and I think the teacher that was teaching it last year that, that I kind of took over from, that's kind of what she was saying that she dedicated, you know, well, she was doing a, a specific date. So if they are specific dates, we, a Wednesday. So if it ended up being a class day for those kids, great. If it didn't, so they were almost getting it every, other week. Mm -hmm. um, but I know for some of them that felt, like I said, as a parent for my son, that was pretty, <laughs> it was cutting it pretty close. Yeah. Too much time in between. And I would say, you know, with a block schedule, um, it's wonderful because they have that more extended time, right? You're not just trying to get them out the door in 45 minutes. Um, I think for you, you might consider, do you want to dedicate a certain amount of time every class meeting to some work? Does that work with what else you're doing? Or do you wanna say, we will work on this for one whole block a week, whether it's on Wednesday or Thursday. Right. We'll just get, we'll just give it a day a week. I yeah. think that's up to you. Um, and again, what, I think the reason that you'll find not so many models that are so specific is because it just depends what else you're covering in the right. class you're teaching this in. Okay. Yeah. That's what but I, we I can, know. yeah, we can also connect you with other teachers who might offer some more concrete um, info about how they do it. And I've got two, three teachers doing sessions later in September that are kind of geared towards that, um, more concrete tips on what they've done in their own classrooms. Okay. Yeah, I've connected with, I went to a meeting with Jim Romrell, who's at mm -hmm. Lake Ridge, and he's given, I've gotten all of their resources. So, um, so I Good. definitely have that help as well. Yeah, great, great. Any other questions from folks? Okay, what I would like to do, because I, I hate to send you out in the world without actual links that you can copy today. So I'm going to give you web links for the NHD Utah page. And then I'll, I'll take you over there visually. So you're gonna to wanna to bookmark that. Okay, so this is the NHD Utah main page. Um, you can see we're part of the Utah Division of State History and this, this can connect you with our digital collections and a whole lot of other programs and resources at the state, the Division of State History, but this is the homepage for History Day. So here is that shareable video. It's about three minutes long. 
It's um, really designed to speak to students. And then down here in our um, resources and toolkits section is where you will bridge out to other resources. So if you look at the teacher resources box, um, we've got those resources on standardized testing for you if you need them. And then if you do the teacher toolkit link, that takes you right into our Padlet where I hope this is um, keeps things organized in a way that you can refer to things when you need them uh, rather than it being overwhelming. So uh, we have the shareable video here, a lot of the stuff we went over today. Um, recordings of all of our PD are gonna be on this Padlet for you as well as the slides and any other supporting like handouts. Um, we've already started populating our theme tools for the Frontiers theme. If you want to start looking through there, I just about have the slide deck done, um, and that'll be up by the time we do our session later this week. So this is this this is the Padlet for you. You also um, are going to want to be using the student toolkits, which is a set of distinct Padlets with student facing tools for the different phases of doing a History Day project. And so each one of these buttons is going to lead you into a specific Padlet for that part of the process. Um, and you can um, use these with your students in ways that make sense for you. Okay, here's the um, download of the rule book, topic selection, what's the annual theme, that kind of thing. And you'll find a whole set of materials in each one of the student toolkit padlets. Okay, so then other resources on our main page. This is the, um, sorry, this is the tile where you link out to find your local contest website. Each one of these links out to the local contest website. Um, let's see. I think that the the, and we put them on by like the location or the town where they are. So this is got last year's dates on it. Our coordinators are in the process of scheduling their new contests and getting their, their websites updated. I can show you the state contest because I worked on that recently. And so it's giving updated information about the state contest. Just be aware that students no students will register directly into the state because they have to track into the program at the appropriate local contest, and then we advance them internally um, if they go up to state. Okay, so this is what these contest websites look like. This is where your students will register for that local contest, um, submit any required online materials with their registration, and then this is also where they will retrieve their judges' comments after the contest is over. Okay. So that is the page where you hop out to find your local contest. Um, and then this is where you can go into our project gallery where there are sample projects from former years and former students in all five of the categories. Okay. And then we've got more information down here, the FAQs that I went over with you, um, our Teacher of the Year Award winners, and then our contest, this is state and national contest results for the last four years. And we will just build those down as we go. Okay, I think that's it. I think this is sort of the bottom. Yeah. So this, this is meant to be a landing page that will take you almost anywhere else that you need to go in terms of um, accessible resources and finding the information that you need. Okay, any other questions I can answer? And I know we've gone a little bit over our time. Um, Wendy, I have a question about the fifth grade process for, mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's not the, for like the state competition. So 
are fifth can fifth graders participate in the state competition? Yes. Okay. Yes. Fourth and fifth graders compete locally and up to state, uh, but they do not call it, they don't the national contest does not serve fourth and fifth graders. Okay. So, so but the time the timelines are this. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the timelines are the same. The timelines are all the same. The okay. deadlines are the same. The competitions have all of the age divisions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right, then. I think I can let you go. I hope that I will see you at future online trainings. Just no, I didn't take you to the teacher professional development, but I know you've seen what we're offering and we're doing some in person and some online. If you cannot do anything in person, almost anything that you need is going to be available as a recording either from last year or something new this year that you can access on the teacher padlet. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you all. I'm excited for the year. And hopefully I'll see you again soon. Thanks, Wendy. Bye-bye. Thank you.